Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about one of the many beautiful facets of Islam. Today's program is very special because we're dealing with one of the keys, one of the biggest and most beautiful of all the facets in Islam. In Arabic, it's called Rahmah, and we usually translate it into English as mercy. But mercy in itself doesn't really carry the depth of this word, so I'd like to explore it for a moment in the Arabic language. It comes from a root, Rahama. This is the root for so many beautiful things that we learn from the Arabic language. And Rahma can be mercy. Rahim, coming from the same root, is graciousness and specific mercy. We learn about the Arham, the Raham and Arham, which is the womb or wombs inside of the mother. And in Arabic, it's understood to be the place of mercy, that a human being is conceived in mercy in the place of mercy in their mother. Many beautiful words coming from this. But specifically today, I want to deal with the ramification and the effect that this rahma has on the human beings. And in fact, all of the creation, all of the creatures of Allah are in this beautiful rahma. In the Quran, we find 114 surahs or chapters and we find these words, Bismillahir Rahman or Rahim, 114 times. At the beginning of each of the surahs, except Surah Al Tawbah, chapter 9, we find this statement in the name of Allah, the most gracious or the most merciful, the most benevolent. So many choices you can use and still not get the depth of Ar Rahman. And then Ar Rahim, specifically gracious, benevolent merciful. And by the way, there is this mention of Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim in one of the other surahs in a letter written by Suleiman. So we find we do have 114 times this statement in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Now when we talk about this mercy, I would like to share with you something that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us about the mercy to help you get a better picture about it. Only one of the words, the Rahman. Now, we're going to talk about this Rahman. One time he was going with his companions, they were traveling along, and he pointed to a lady who had a baby. And he said to them, would this lady allow that her baby be thrown into a fire? And they were shocked. They said, no way, man. That never going to happen. Never, never, never. He said, this is because of her Rahman, and this Rahman is from Allah's Rahman. It's from his mercy. And that every creature, every creature there is, every woman that ever was, and all of the mercy for all of the babies, since the beginning of time to the end of time, all through the universe, always, any mercy, it's all actually from Allah's mercy that he's bestowed on the earth. Now, then what he said, and that's only one part of Allah's mercy. He has one hundred parts and all of this that we know about in the universe is really only one. The other 99 parts of Allah's mercy are waiting for the believer on the day of judgment. This is very special for us. I want you to stop and think for a minute. In other religions, when they talk about salvation, how will you be saved? Usually they have some kind of sacrifice that has to be performed. There must be some sacrifice to appease the gods or God. Some in their religions have said that the gods need to have a virgin girl thrown into a volcano. In the early days of Christianity in Egypt, even they had this superstition, if you will, of throwing a virgin girl into the Nahar Nile, into the Nile River to appease the river god so that they would be assured that they're going to have good crops, that the water's going to run and take care of them. Otherwise, they would be afraid 
the river won't run because the river god is not happy with us. And they would throw these virgin girls into the, into the river to drown. Throughout the history of religions, we find that there are these sacrifices. Sometimes they want a sacrificial lamb or some other animal to be put on an altar and slaughtered and then burned and then this smoke or whatever is supposed to reach their gods. In the Quran, Allah denies this categorically saying that it's not the smoke that reaches him, but it's your act of piousness. So when the Muslim is asked to sacrifice the animal, it's not because of appeasing the gods or God in this sense. Rather, it is so that the meat reaches the poor, the indigent, the impoverished, and this is an act of sacrifice from the individual. Yes, I have to spend my money to buy the animal. We have to sacrifice him. But then when we take the meat, we make sure to give it out to the people to eat it. It's not just a waste that burning up flesh for some god. This was made clear in the Quran as well. And salvation comes to the person not by these acts, but rather by something that's inside of the person when he does the act. As an example, when a person prays and they stand and bow and prostrate in front of their Lord, they receive mercy from Him. But it isn't because of the act, the physical act. It's because of what's inside the person while he does it. If he's sincere with his God, then he receives this mercy. The same is true for fasting. Muslims fast the month of Ramadan. And in the month of Ramadan, the Muslim avoids eating, drinking and intimate relations with his spouse. He doesn't do this during the daylight hours. But what makes it a source of mercy for him is not that he's gone without food and drank, but rather it's what's inside of him while he did it. Because consider the person who couldn't stand up for prayer. Let's say they're crippled or they're in a wheelchair, something like this. They wouldn't be able to stand, would they? nor could they possibly bow or prostrate on the ground. And the one who has some disease or some problem in the stomach, they're not able to fight. So what about them? And how would they attain this same kind of rahma or mercy? The one who goes in pilgrimage, and what they're doing here is going on the Hajj or Umrah, and they're going all the way to Mecca, they're sacrificing and they're performing these rituals according to the way of Abraham and his son Ishmael. How would they get mercy from this? And again, it's going to depend on what's inside of them and their sincerity while they do it. Finally, I'd like to refer also to something called zakat or the purification of wealth by distribution of a certain portion of a person's wealth every year to those who are impoverished. So feeding the poor and taking care of the indigent, helping the orphans, all of this gets mercy for a person from his Lord. But it's not just the act, but rather what's inside while doing it. What is the attitude of the individual? I'd like to refer to something to help you better understand this. When I first came into Islam, I heard a story that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told. He told about three people who come on the Day of Judgment. One of them is asked, what did you do with the life that God gave you, the favors that he gave you? He said, oh, I used it to fight in your cause. And I was a mighty fighter and warrior in Islam. And as such, I died and was martyred, martyred for you, O Allah. And he'd be told, no, you did it. So people would say you were a mighty warrior, a soldier. And they said it. Now, you've had your reward from where? From the people. Therefore, he doesn't get Allah's mercy. And he's dragged on his face into the fire of hell. Now, another person would be brought and asked the similar question, what do you do with his life and the favors that Allah gave him? And he's going to say that, oh, you know, I got knowledge. I was a scholar for Islam, and I learned the Quran, and I taught the Quran. And then he'd be told, no, no, you're lying. You did it so the people would say you were a scholar. You already had your reward. No mercy now. So he'll be dragged on his face into hell. Another, the third, is brought and asked a similar question. He's going to say similarly that, oh, yes, I did the, everything for Allah. And I was receiving great wealth. And I spent all this wealth for the cause of Allah and did these charitable acts, noble deeds with this wealth that I distributed. 
he'll be told, no, you're lying. You did it so the people would say that you were generous. And they said it. So again, he's had his reward with the people, but not from Allah. No mercy for him and be dragged on his face into the fire of hell. Now, I share this with you because I want you to think about something. When I tell people about Islam, they're not Muslim, and they want to know, what is the salvation in Islam? Can you tell me? Can you promise me that if I come into Islam, I'll be saved? And as we've mentioned in other programs, no, I can't promise you that. In fact, the only thing I can promise you is hell. If you come into Islam, it's real easy to go to hell because if you're not right inside, if the heart is not right, then you're not going to receive anything from Allah in the way of mercy. You're not going to get your salvation. You're not going to go to paradise. Because it's not just words. It's very much what's inside. So it means that other human beings really will not be able to judge you, will they? You may not look all that righteous to somebody else, but Allah will know what's inside of you. Similarly, you may look very righteous to others, but Allah, again, knows what's inside. And as such, that person, he doesn't receive this mercy. So this rahmah, this mercy, can be general and it can be specific. When we say rahim, it's very specific. And this is going to be now for those believers on the day of judgment when it's becoming evident now who the real, real believers are those who had the good heart, tried their best, believed in God, they did their best, then they get this specific mercy, and that's called the Rahim. Now, I'm going to let you reflect on that. I've got something really exciting to tell you about when we come back after the break, but I want to break out for a minute, think about what I was talking about, and then we're going to be right back after this. Stay right there. We'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam, and we're talking about one of the beautiful facets of Islam, maybe one of the most beautiful of all, is called Rahmah, or the mercy in Islam. We've talked about it from the standpoint that there is something called mercy in Islam. There's this overwhelming forgiveness, if you will, or mercy, or graciousness, benevolence of Almighty God. All of this we're trying to wrap into really one word, Rahma. We've also mentioned that there's another word similar from the same root, Rahim, specifically for those who come to the right belief. They do the deeds of righteousness. They have begged to be forgiven for any sins. And then they're entitled to this Rahim on the Day of Judgment. But generally speaking, but generally speaking, we're going to talk now about this subject of Rahma from the standpoint of the Qur'an itself. In the Qur'an, we find a statement in there talking about the Rahmah to the Alameen. And it says that in fact, that it is none other than the Prophet who's coming with this, this message of mercy. And it says that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the mercy to the Alameen. Now, a lot of people translate that and say, he's the mercy to the world, or it's mercy to mankind. But in fact, the word alamin is meaning two worlds. Two worlds. I want to talk about that just for a minute. In Islam, we know that Allah created angels. He created them from light. And Allah created them without any free will. They have no choice in the matter. The next creation that Allah made after angels is called jinn. And these are made from a smokeless fire. Again, that's why you don't see them. There's no smoke involved, but there's heat. These jinn also exist in a parallel world to us, and they also have free will, just like humans. The next creation of Allah is the human being, starting with Adam. And Allah created Adam from dirt or dust. And then he gave Adam the same as he had given these jinn, which is free choice. Along the way, I would like to also mention another part of Allah's mercy in the Qur'an. There's a whole chapter. I wish you would read it. I wish you would take the time to sit and enjoy this chapter of the Qur'an. Chapter 55, Surah Al-Rahman, the chapter of mercy. And Allah begins talking about His mercy right from the beginning. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, Ar-Rahman. And He says, He is the All-Merciful. And He's the one who sent down this Qur'an in full knowledge. He's the one who knows 
this recitation because it's his own speech and he's talking to you. He's talking to me. Read it. And then notice as you go along, there's this one ayah that just keeps coming back up again. This one ayah surfaces back up. Then all of a sudden it's like every other ayah is this same ayah or verse, the same verse, keeps coming back. What is it? A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. It says, Fabi ayya ala irabbikum atukadhiban. Which of the favors, the na'ma favors of your Lord are you two then going to deny? It says two, by the way. Allah says, kadhiban. Two liars. Why? Because Allah is speaking not only to the human beings here. He's speaking to the jinn as well. Because you see the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been sent to both worlds. To the jinn and to the mankind. There's another chapter in the Quran. You can verify what I just said. Look it up. Chapter 72 in the Quran. It's called Surtul Jinn. It explains how the jinn heard this recitation of Quran and recognize it to be from their Lord as well. And some of them, the jinn, by the way, are Muslims. Some are Christians, some are Jews, some are fire worshippers, some are disbelievers, just like human beings. But Allah keeps asking them and us, which of the favors will you two then deny? And after that, you think, and look at what he said right before that. He's telling so many of the scientific facts that we know today. Go to the book and read it for yourself. He's saying about the two seas that come together, yet they never mix. They contain different consistencies. They contain different temperatures, different salinity, different amount of salt, different life, different vegetation, and it just doesn't ever cross over. There's a barrier, and he talks about that. He talks about so many things here. You should read it. When he talks about for instance, and I love this one, go to verse number 30, and he's telling you again the statement. And then right after that, he says he's going to deal with you two prominent groups. He's going to deal with you. And then he says it again. Which of the favors now of your Lord are you going to deny? You two guys, you two groups of jinn and mankind. Now what he says. Just in case you weren't sure he's talking to jinn and mankind, he says, Now, O you assembly of jinn and you assembly of mankind, come together, both of you, and try. Go ahead, I want you to try. Go on out. Try to get out of Earth's atmosphere. Do it. Do it. And you're never going to do it until and unless you come up with a great and mighty power. And it's in Arabic, illa bi sultan. And then again he says, Fabi a'i'a Allah irabbikum atukadiban. Which of the favors of your Lord will you two groups then deny? And now look what he says. He says a flame of fire and smoke coming out here. Talking about what? What's he talking about? And again, Which of the favorites of your Lord will you then deny? You too. Now, has this hit you yet, what he's described? When we want to go out of Earth's atmosphere, and we do that now, how do we do it? With a slingshot? <laughs> no. Catapult? No. Huh? A wind-up toy? No. We use a rocket ship. And what do we use for fuel for the rocket ship? Fire? Flame? Lots of smoke? Is it describing that? Think. And he says, a great and mighty authority or power, Sultan. When you purchase fuel for your car, what do you buy? A liter, yeah? A liter of fuel. Or a gallon, depending on what country you're in. So, when they purchase the fuel for these rocket ships, how do they buy it? By the liter? Uh-uh. Gallon? Uh-uh. Quart? No. Ounce? No. They buy it by the ton. Tons and tons and tons of fuel. 
and it makes a horrendous flame, a giant flame that comes, a huge fire and so much billowing smoke. Next time one of them goes off, check it out. Look at it on the news and see. Is that the description you see? And how could anybody 1,400 years ago tell you the exact description in detail of what it's going to take to put this monstrous thing, this, this rocket and satellites and so on in outer space? Perfect description. From who? The Rub. The Lord, Rabb al-Alameen, the Lord of the two worlds, has spoken. And he's made it clear, though, for those, for those who will repent to him and ask for his mercy, it's there. Keep reading this chapter. Keep reading it, and you're going to be surprised because there are two rewards for the believer, the one who repents, believes, and does the deeds of righteousness. It talks about two paradises and two gardens and it's got two rivers, two springs, two kinds of fruit. Everything is double, 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 double. Double reward, double reward in every aspect. For those that disbelieve, it only promises them the one punishment, hellfire, which is plenty. You know, that's horrible. But in the paradise, so many beautiful things. If you just had an idea, just a small idea of what Islam is talking about, with this Rahmah of Allah, I do believe you'd like to consider more about Islam. Because the Rahmah or the mercy of Allah, it's mentioned in so many of the teachings in the Quran itself, and the teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him, is so beautiful. And it makes me, when I read it, I just feel so comfortable to know that even though I'm a sinner, I've made so many mistakes, and I never want anybody to know about them. But all of us have done so, haven't we? But there is hope, and there is mercy, and it's only going to come from the all-merciful. The only thing stopping anybody from receiving that mercy is that they refuse it. And they refuse it by denying, by denying the merciful. They're denying our Rahman, and he says, Fabi aia. Allah irabbikum atukadiban. Which of the favors of your Lord will you to then deny? We ask for Allah's mercy, His Rahmah, upon all of His creation and to give the guidance so they can wake up and receive it. Acknowledge there really is only one God and He is our Rahman. He is the merciful. And that is this facet, this beautiful facet of the facets of Islam. Till next time. Is Yusuf Estes asking for mercy for all of us? Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Islam, like the precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host on Facets of Islam. In today's episode, I'd like to deal with a very important facet of Islam called brotherhood. In the Arabic language, the word for brother is akh. Akh. And when it's possessive, my brother it has the E sound at the end of it, Achi, Achi. Plural, Ikhwan. And when it's a girl, there's a difference in Arabic for the girl or boy, so you say, Ukhti, Ukhti. Now that we've dealt with the word, let's find out what the real meaning of it is in Islam. All religions consider those who are participants or believers in it to be brothers and sisters to each other. Whether they're from Bani Israel, the children of Israel, or the Christians, Hindus, all faiths, usually they have this expression of brother and sister in their particular faith. Islam is no different in this regard. But there's something special about this facet in that the way the believer is looking at their brothers and sisters and how they're to be treated. 
As a matter of fact, Islam is so inclusive, and we've talked about that in other episodes, that it really does include all the creation and all the human beings. So that we find even somebody who is not of our particular faith can still be, in a sense, a brother or sister to us. The reason is because Allah tells us in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ya yuhan nas la taqa rabbukum Allah de khalaqakum min nafsin wahidin, wa khalaqa minha zawjaha, the meaning here is that Allah is saying, all human beings, that means everybody. It's not just talking to Muslims or Christians, Jews. It's saying everybody, all human beings, have taqwa for your rub. And that means to have full regard, be dutiful, God-fearing of your Lord, who created all of you for a single soul. That single soul, of course, is Adam. And from Adam, from his rib, is created Eve. And from these two, Allah says in the Quran, he's brought forth many, many, many. And Kathirin means so many, you know, uh, human beings, men and women. We also learn in the Quran, by the way, that Allah made us different. He made us into various nations and tribes and made us different in our features, in our looks, in our colors from each other in order that we would recognize each other. Now, as such, all of us, as Muslims, consider everybody to be our brother and sister. It's very common in many countries where you find Muslims calling people brother and sister, and they're not even Muslims. They will say brothers, this, sister, that. The reason because the Muslim does believe that all of us came from the same source, and all of us are brothers and sisters in humanity. But then, there's another level in Islam, and that's the brother and sister in belief. And this is very special, because now, regardless of your background, of your genealogy, or your particular nation or tribe that you come from, or your skin color, regardless of any of those things, if you come into the belief in Islam, you're considered a full and complete brother in faith. And to be in this faith is required to believe there's only one God, that Allah is the one God, the only God, the only creator and sustainer of the universe. That God is not like his creation. He's not a part of his creation. He's uniquely one. And this is very simple, as we've also discussed in our other episodes, that a person could simply say, God, and go like this, and it's enough for us to understand that you've got the concept. One God, and he's up and out of the creation. Sufficient. Once a person has made this declaration of faith, he is considered a brother or sister in Islam. Let me give you an example so you can get the idea. At the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, there were many battles going on. Different people were fighting against the Muslims for different reasons. And in one of the battles that they had, there was a person who was just about to kill somebody. A Muslim was about to kill an enemy. But just as he did, the person said, I bear witness there's no deity worship except God, the one God. Irregardless of this statement, this Muslim man took his sword and he killed this enemy, killed him dead. When this news came back to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he heard about the situation. He became very distraught. He was very upset. And he kept accusing the person who had done this in a bad way, saying that, how do you know what was in this man's heart? He said, but he only said it so we wouldn't kill him. He said, no, do you, did you open his heart? Did you look in? Did you see what was in there? Because the only reason for these battles, the only reason for any of this striving and struggling to start with is just to raise up this correct belief that there is only one God. So as soon as somebody says that, you stop. You have nothing against him. He became your brother. Now, do understand that just because somebody says that, we are going to accept him as a brother, but we're not going to turn our sword over to them and let them kill us. <laughs> we are going to still use our common sense, yes. But look at the statement now that we have from Muhammad about this. He said, anybody who says, La ilaha illallah, there's none to worship except the law, he's your brother. And as such, his property and his life 
are safe from your hand. So it isn't proper for a Muslim ever to take the property or the rights or especially the life of another Muslim or anybody, in fact, who says, La ilaha illallah. There's none to worship except the law. This in itself shows you the importance in the fabric now of the weaving together of the brotherhood. It's very essential in Islam that all the Muslims come together on this subject to understand there's only one God, to worship him alone without partners is to be in that brotherhood. There, of course, are many different opinions on other subjects. Some things that people talk about in the Salah, for instance, or the, the worship. Some people will talk about different things that occur in uh, the way that we worship Allah. And others will talk about things that are pertinent to their particular nation or location in geography. But essentially, the belief is what is required. Let me explain another thing about this. Coming from a Christian background myself, I know that the Muslims have got a lot in common with what Christians and Jews teach and believe. What makes the big difference, though, is the strictness of the belief in God being one and unique and that he must be obeyed on his terms. And we mustn't alter his teachings because that also would take a person away from the true belief. Now, having said all of this and having established at least a case for general brotherhood and then more specific brotherhood, I want to now take a few moments to talk about what Muhammad, peace be upon him, said about our brothers in Islam, our brothers in faith, and look at some of the beautiful teachings. First of all, he tells us that we are brothers to each other. We mustn't ever infringe upon that brotherhood by doing what? To take the property or to take the rights of a brother or sister in Islam and that we mustn't take their lives. That we've already discussed and we want to be sure that that's clear. Regardless, if somebody said, I'm in this group, I'm in that group of Islam or that group of Islam, then all of these things still make it that we consider them in the unity of Islam and they are brothers. Now, what I want you to do, reflect on what I just said. I want us to take a break. And then when we come back, I want to be real specific about what's inside of that particular brotherhood in Islam. So we can take this break now. Stay where you are. Be right back after this on Facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We're back. I'm Yusuf Estes. This is Facets of Islam. And we're talking on the subject of brotherhood. And we've already discussed about the general aspect of brotherhood. That is, that we're all brothers and sisters in humanity. But now I want to come down to the Muslims living today in this world that we're upon. There are those who claim that we're in this particular group or this particular tariqa or this particular way or this particular menhaj and so and so and so. We hear so much about these groups without giving any particular name to them in our program. Just I'm sure you've heard about them. But is it right to consider some of them to be out of Islam or even that only one of them could be right? Well, that's a pretty good question, isn't it? Let us look to what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said about that. He told us that as Jews, followers of Judaism, and Christians divide up into so many groups that Muslims would divide even more. The way he said it in Arabic is often misunderstood in English. What he said was that we translate it to be, as Jews and Christians divide into 71 or 72 groups, you Muslims will divide into 73. And all of them will be in the hellfire, illa wahid, except for one. And that's what me and my companions are on today. First of all, let's deal with the numbers. The expression he used in Arabic is understood to be more like, well, when your mom tells you, when you come in the house, don't slam the door. So you come in the house, slam the door. 
Then you come in the house again, you slam the door. She says, I told you a hundred times, don't slam the door. You come in again, slam the door. She says, I told you a thousand times, don't slam the door. You come through and slam the door again. She said, I told you a thousand and one times, don't slam the door. What she means by the numbers is, I've told you a lot. I've told you even more. And now this is it. This is the breaking point. <laughs> that's it. And essentially, that's what he meant by 71, 72, 73 groups. I want to tell you that now so you don't sit here and try to count. Okay, I found the Jews divided up into the Ossenes, Nazarenes, Pharisees, uh, Sadducees, and we found the Orthodox Jew, the Modernist Jew, the Reformed Jew. Don't do that. And then uh, Christians, okay, we have the Orthodox Christian, the Catholic Christian, the European Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, we have the Catholics, we have the Baptists, we have the Anabaptists, we have... (laughs) You don't need to do that. Because that isn't what he intended for you to do. Nor is it right to go through and list all the different kinds of Muslims that you find. This group and this group and that group and this group and oh, there's so many kinds and this kind of Muslim and that kind of Muslim. Yes, we know they're there. How many? I don't know. But for sure, as much as the Jews had divided, the Christians did divide more. And again, you'll find the same true of the Muslims. The prophet himself said that only one group out of all of them is going to be the saved group, if you will. Meaning that the ones who followed his book that he came with, which was the Quran, and his teaching, his Sunnah or the Hadith. This is what he said. It's very clear. He even indicated in the last day there would be those who would only take the Quran and wouldn't take any of his teachings. They would reject the Hadith. And by the way, one of those groups today has surfaced. And they claim, we only follow the Quran and we don't take any of the teachings of Muhammad. Sad for them, but then they fell right into the group that he talked about. But how should I treat these people? And this is where we find about real brotherhood. If I'm willing to sit and listen to somebody who doesn't believe at all, an atheist, a mulhid. I'm willing to talk with him and consider him my brother in humanity. I'm willing to sit and talk with him and help him to understand Islam. Likewise, I'm willing to sit with the Buddhist or the Hindu and consider him also my brother in humanity. I'm willing to discuss at length with those who are from the background of Beni Israel, the children of Israel, and those who claim to be Christian. I'm willing, again, to sit with them, talk with them, and see how we can come together and benefit in this life and hopefully in the next life by coming to the correct belief there's only one God. We need to do what he wants us to do. I'm willing to do that with these people. So why all of a sudden now would I not be willing to sit together with my Muslim brother who says, La ilaha illallah. He said, there's only one God to worship. Why wouldn't I want to at least sit with him and talk? And if he said, yes, but brother, you know they don't believe like we do. How do you know? Because they're in such and such a group. Okay. Maybe you're right. But what if you're not? What if you go back and read and listen, find out what Muhammad, peace be upon him, said? I've already mentioned, but I'll mention it again. That when the person killed the man who said, I believe there's only one God, he said it. The one killing him said, yes, but he only said it so that we wouldn't kill him. And, you know, he was not being honest. But look what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said about it. Did you open his heart? Did you know what was in it? And the person said, I wish that I had not entered Islam yet that I could go back and just start all over as a new Muslim. Because when you do that, by the way, all previous sins are forgiven. Because the person was concerned, I really did kill somebody here who said that. So isn't it wrong for us today to just automatically lump everybody into a group and say all of them are going to go to hell? Well, who are you? When did you become the judge? When did I become judge of anybody? No. I need to take it easy here and examine, examine what the person is saying. Maybe he grew up in a group, his family is in this group, and so he claims that group. But if we sit and talk together and we find that he believes there's only one God, He follows the Quran to the best of his ability. He believes in the teachings of Muhammad. So what's the problem? If he has a deviation away from that, let us examine that and see if we can discuss it together. And if you say, well, I'm not qualified. I don't have the right knowledge. Okay, then fine. 
let him talk to the scholars. Let the people have a chance to hear the message the right way. And consider everybody your brother until they prove otherwise. If somebody comes to me and says, I'm a Muslim, fine and dandy, he's a Muslim. Until he claims something else that puts him out by his own choice, I'm not putting him out of Islam. That's not my job, and I'm not going to do it. I have not done that in 16 years I've been Muslim. I don't intend to start today. I want really Allah to forgive me. I need Allah's forgiveness. I need his mercy. I need to be in this brotherhood because all of us are together of one big, beautiful brotherhood. Listen to this, teaching of Muhammad. He told us that the brotherhood of Islam or the nation of Islam, he called it an ummah, which is a very beautiful word, ummah. He said that we're like one body, one body, that if any part of the body is in pain, the whole of the body is suffering. Now, you imagine there are Muslims all the way from Indonesia, all the way to Saudi Arabia, to Egypt, all of Africa, full of Muslims. Europe, there are Muslims. In UK, the Americas, around the world, there are Muslims, everywhere. And if one is suffering, then the whole of the body is suffering. This is what we were told. So we should have compassion, so much compassion for our brothers and sisters in Islam. Some of the teachings, Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, he's not even a believer until he prefers the needs of his brother over his own needs. So when I go out and I, oh, I need this for me, I need that for me, oh, I like that, that's nice, this is nice. And I realize my brother is over here doing without those things, but I took my needs over his, I basically am falling away from the true belief. Because as Prophet said, peace be upon him, he is not a true believer until he prefers the needs of his brother over his own needs. That's clear. Another statement, how about the one who fills his stomach and goes to sleep at night while his brother's stomach remains empty? This is key. This is very key. This could also mean a brother in humanity. So if your next door neighbor is not a Muslim, but he's hungry, you have the responsibility to feed them. This is evidenced by the very actions of Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he used to feed non-Muslims. And stop and think, isn't that a sweet way to treat everybody? Give everybody benefit of the doubt. Don't pass judgment on them. Now, some groups will say you have to do this and you have to do that. If they can produce for you evidence from the Quran, from the teachings of Muhammad, then by the way, why not? Because sometimes we, you and I, we might be in something ourselves that's not exactly right on the money. We might be wrong. Oh, you didn't want to hear that, right? <laughs> you might be wrong. I might be wrong. Even now sitting here, maybe I say something wrong. Then it's your responsibility to come sit with me and show me. It's my responsibility to do the same for you. Just, here is the book. I've been quoting from the book, the Quran, translated to English. I've been talking about the teachings of Muhammad. Again, translated to English as best as I understood. But if I miss something, then certainly it's your responsibility. You should write to me, send me an email, or talk to me. It's only right. But don't consider just because somebody said something the wrong way that immediately this is kafir, you have to kill them, you can stop for Allah. Allah forgive us. This is too much. And certainly we're seeing some of this happening in the world today. Now the Muslim population has reached one and a half billion human beings on the earth. And that's really great. But amongst them, there are some that are pretty ignorant. Some are pretty stupid. And some make big mistakes. But that doesn't really change the message of Islam, does it? No. By the way, talking about brotherhood, when I grew up, I had only sisters. I had a sister, and then another born, and then another was born. And I kept wishing I had a brother. I wanted a brother so bad. Even when the baby was born, the last sister, they put her in my room, and they were giving her my clothes as she was growing up because, you know, we were not poor, but we conserved on clothing. Let's put it that way. And I was thinking, okay, don't tell her she's a girl. We'll raise her up to be a boy and she can play with me. Throw the ball back and forth, help me fly the kite, all the different things. 
but somebody ruined it and told her she was a girl and she started playing with dolls and it was all over. And I continued to grow up with no brothers. In fact, until I got to Islam, I never felt like I really had a brother. But after I came into Islam and I met these wonderful, wonderful Muslims and saw how they did do exactly that, they were concerned more for my needs than their own. They were concerned about me eating even if they didn't. I was very impressed with this brotherhood, this wonderful, wonderful brotherhood of Islam. And for sure, if you haven't experienced it, you haven't really tasted one of the beautiful facets of Islam, and that's the brotherhood. I hope and pray that Allah will join all of us together as brothers and sisters in the true belief, guide us to his way, and put us in his paradise. Amin. Until next time, this is Yusuf Estes, wishing you all the best from the facets of Islam. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullah. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host on Facets of Islam. Today's facet or aspect of Islam that we'd like to talk about is called Huda or guidance, the guidance in Islam. In fact, this is so important that without it, there wouldn't be any Islam. <laughs> there has to be guidance. It's like a person who can't find their way in the dark, someone who's lost and needs some help, someone to externally give them the information, the map or direction on how to get out of their situation and get back to where they want to be. All of this fits exactly the description of the Huda or guidance in Islam. This word Huda is found throughout the Quran in different aspects. In fact, Ihdi, which is from that, is the imperative, and it's an order. When you order somebody to do it, Ihdi, 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 guide, guide, guide. And when you say Ihdi na, guide us, guide us, guide us. Let's look to the opening of the Quran and see what it says. The believer is worshiping Allah, he's turned to his book, he's opened it up, and it tells him, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All the praise, the worship, and the devotion is only to the Lord of the worlds. Ar Rahman Rahim. The most gracious, the most merciful. Maliki Yamadin, the owner and the judge on the day of judgment. Iyaka nabudu wa iyaka nastarin. You only are we going to turn to for worship. We're giving you the worship, and you only we're turning to for guidance. The worship is for you, and the guidance comes from you. Now comes the statement. Ehdi. Ehdi na guide us. Sirat mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. Then it continues, Saratul Ladina, Anamta Alayhim. The path of those that have your na'ma or favor. Ghairul Magdubi. And not the path of those who have your ghadab or your anger. What a dhalim. Or those who are lost. These seven verses are repeated in the prayers of the Muslims many times every single day. Minimum 17 times in a day that a Muslim is saying these beautiful words. But the focus of the whole thing is on this word, Huda or Ihdi, Ihdina. Because you see, in the beginning, the person was praising Allah, acknowledging who he was, talking about his greatness and majesty and his ownership of all the universe, then mentioning that we worship him and saying that he's the one we turn to for guidance and then specifically giving him the imperative you guide us you guide us who Allah so this is how the Quran begins telling Allah that we want him to guide us we're asking and begging for the guidance from Almighty God well that's all well and good a lot of people could say well 
In our religion, too, you know, we ask God to guide us or the gods to guide us. But then continue reading in the very next chapter of the Quran, and you're going to find out something amazing here, the claim that's going to be made. Because the next thing after a person reads these seven verses, the Quran continues. Again, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Alif Lam Mim, and these are three letters from the Arabic alphabet. Dhalikul kitabu la rayba fi hudil mutaqin. That is the book. By the way, some people mistranslate this. They say, this is the book. But in Arabic, hadha means this, and dhalik, that means that. Dhalikul kitab, that book. And it means the book with the law. The book that can't be touched by humans or anyone. It's the book with the law. Dhalikul kitab, book. La raybafi. It has no doubt in it. That book with the law has no doubt in it. Huda lil mutaqin. And it is a huda. It's a guidance for those who have taqwa. Mutaqin. And this it shows you mu in the beginning says the one who's doing the verb, taqi, one who has it, mutaqin. Whoever really has this taqwa is going to be guided by that book with the law. Represented to us, of course, as the Quran, the speech of Allah. And then it continues saying, Alladina, those who believe in the unseen. It says, I want to be away from other than this anger of Allah, this punishment of Allah. Now, how am I going to get there? I need this taqwa. First thing to do is believe in al ghaib Believe in al ghaib That's the number one thing to do. You might say, well, how is that going to help me? Ha, ah, because correct belief is the foundation in Islam to get to the level of taqwa. al ghaib What's it? What is the al ghaib Do you see Allah? No. Can you hear Allah? No. Smell, touch, feel, imagine? No. So he's in al ghaib He's unseen. The paradise. Do you believe in paradise? Because that's also in the unseen. Do you believe in a hellfire? Do you believe in a next life? Do you believe in a hereafter? All of these things are in the unseen. And in order for you to qualify to be somebody to be guided by the book that Allah is talking about, you have to have this quality. This quality of belief in Al-Ghaib. Then it continues. And to do what? To establish proper worship. Establish proper worship. And then to pay charity from the provisions that Allah gives you. That's the next part that it's talking about here. All of this is part and parcel of being guided. Not done yet. Hold on. There's more. And you have to believe in what's being sent down to Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is Quran. And then another, another category here, another qualification. You have to believe in what was sent down before. As a Muslim, this might shock you. Maybe you didn't know this. But as a Muslim, we have to believe in what was sent before Muhammad as well. The scriptures the books, the Psalms, the Gospel, the Torah, all of this is part and parcel of what the Muslim believes in. That might shock you. You might think, how? You mean you believe my Bible? No, I don't believe your Bible. Your Bible's in English. But I do believe the original that came down from God to Jesus, to Moses, to Abraham in the beginning. Yes. You may not find it existing anymore today. Not in your books, but we still have it in the Quran because Allah has reminded us in the Quran about statements that he revealed before. He has given this. He's preserved it. If you want to know what was said, go to the Quran and read it. So, yes, we believe as Muslims in the original wahi or revelation. We believe in what's sent to Muhammad, which is Quran. And we believe in the unseen. We believe in Allah and his angels, his messengers or prophets. We believe in the day of judgment. We believe in the qadr of Allah, the destiny. All of these are the things in the unseen, and it's required. 
This is one of the facets without which you do not have the whole gem. You must know that this belief is part and parcel. Once you have this, and you said, yes, I'm willing to believe it. I, maybe I don't know what it means. I don't understand everything, but I'll accept it. I'll believe that. Then you will be guided by this recitation, this Quran. Now, let's talk a little bit about the people before. Were they guided? According to us, absolutely without doubt, the guidance came. Whether they accepted it or not is another matter. The guidance which came with Adam in the first place was for him to know how to repent. Allah had sent him revelation in the sense that he knew things. He knew how to name things around him. And he knew how to repent for having eaten the fruit. Revelation also came to Abraham. And then he knew who his God was and who his God wasn't. Because all of this is mentioned also in the Quran that Abraham, he wasn't guided. He didn't know. And he was saying, I'm not going to be guided unless Allah guides me. Who is Allah? I don't know. Is it the moon? Is it the stars? Is No, that sets, this sets. Where's God? And he said it. I won't be guided unless he guides me. Let you think about this one for a few minutes. We'll take a break. We're going to come right back now. But... Focus on this idea about guidance. When we come back on this facets of Islam, we can get specific about how I can be guided and how others are being guided even today in Islam. Sit right there. We'll be right back with more facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes. We're back with more facets of Islam. We're talking now on the subject of guidance. We've been talking about the word Huda. It's also called Hidayah. And we were talking about the people of before, before Muhammad, and were they guided? And we said, yes, they were. As a matter of fact, the children of Israel were selected by Allah, and he gave them his biggest favor, a big favor on them, which is called Hidayah, guidance. The guidance of Allah for these people, they're chosen to receive guidance, and they were called Yahudi, Yahud the one who is being guided or the one selected for this guidance, Hidayah. So all along, there's been this guidance available for human beings if they wanted it. In the case of those who never heard about Arabic language or they never heard of Moses or Abraham or Jesus or never heard of Muhammad, could they still be guided? And the answer is yes, because Allah is Al-Hadi. Now, one of the names of Allah is Hadi, that means the guide, Al-Hadi, he's the guide. In fact, he is the only guide. There's no other guide beside Allah. Whomever he guides, they will never go astray. But whoever he lets go astray, they're never going to be guided. It's as simple as that, because he is the guide and he guides to the straight path any that he wills. Now, you may love somebody and wish that they would be properly guided. You want them to go to paradise. You want them to be on this belief of only one God, of worshiping him. You would like that. You would do anything to get them to believe. I love them so much. Let them have this message. But Allah answers you in the Quran real clear. He says, you do not guide those whom you love, but it is Allah who guides whomever he wills. Guidance is not in your hands, not in my hands. In fact, it's a gift from Allah, a favor from Almighty God that you are guided at all. So special to be guided to his way. His way, as we've talked about in another program, other episode is called Deen, this Deen of Islam. And look what he says about it. That on this day that he's perfected for you, your way, your deen, conferred upon you his biggest netma, netmati is possessive, and chosen for you to submit, surrender, and obey him 
in peace. And all of that together means Islam. And that was the last word in the sentence. Guidance. One time it happened to me that I was on the Nile River in Egypt with some friends and they were asking me, how did you get to Islam? What was it like? Tell us about it. And one of the questions they were asking is, what's the difference between not being a Muslim and being a Muslim? I said, what? They said, well, we grew up in Islam. All we know is Islam. This is what we know. So tell us what it's like. Give us a sense of what it's like before Islam and after Islam. I thought about it. I said, I don't know. I can't answer you. I don't know. Well, that night, I was praying about this subject, and the next morning I had the answer. And I told them, okay, you ask me a question, I want to give you the answer. They said, what question? I said, you ask me, what's the difference between not being a Muslim and then coming to Islam? I said, yeah. I said, you see the river right there? That's the Nile River, yeah? I need from you one word, and then I can tell you. They said, what word? I said, on the back of the boat, there's a boat going by. On the back of that boat, there's this thing at the back of it. What do you call that in your language? They said, Duffa. Because I wanted to tell them um, in Arabic, I'm trying to explain to them. They said, this is Duffa. I said, okay, this, Duffa. I said, now imagine yourself in a boat and you're out here in the river and you can't see. You're blindfolded, no light, zero, and you have no Duffa. You don't have this steering, this rudder. I said, okay. I said, now imagine you can feel the boat moving you're going to the right, to the left. You feel the motion, the rocking. You think, okay, the current is giving me direction. Maybe that's it. Or maybe the wind. May I feel wind. But really and truly, you don't have a clue. You don't know where you are. You don't know how you got there. You don't know where you're going. And you don't know what's propelling you. You have no clue. But then, then somebody removes the blindfold and you can see. Oh, and then they give you this duffa, this rudder or guide. And now, it doesn't mean you're going to be successful necessarily, but at least you have a chance because you can see and you have some control over your life. And this is how I felt when I came out of what I was before into Islam. Now, when I was trying to convert somebody to Islam, I've talked about this a lot in our episodes, one of the last things that he said to me was, that the guidance had to come from above. Now I had just seen a Catholic priest enter Islam. I had just witnessed my own wife saying that she wanted to also enter into Islam. And I was totally shocked because these people had been very staunch in Catholicism for the priest and born again Christian, my wife. Now. How? You know, and I'm asking these questions and I'm bringing all these different arguments. And my Muslim friend said to me, for the last three or four months that we've been discussing, it's been you, me, you and your father, you and your wife, you and this priest, you and these preachers and ministers, all the different people you've been talking to. But at this stage, he said, I can't help you now because now you've reached a level where it's between you and your Lord. All the guidance is right there. Do you want it or you don't? up to you but don't tell me tell him and he left me he went off to do his prayers and I found myself looking around like whoa what's what's the next step for me what do I need to do and I found a place out behind my father's house that was secluded and covered and there in that position I said now let's see which way does that Muslim usually face when he, when he wants to offer his prayers how does he do that then I remembered, ah, ah, yeah, let me aim like that. And then I put my head down, put my head down on the ground. And with my head on the ground, just as I had seen him do, just as I imagined that the prophets of old had done that, which says in the Bible, they fell on their faces in worship. So here I am on my face, my head on the ground, and I said these words. Oh God, if you're there, Guide me. That's all I said. And then when I raised up, I didn't see rainbows and stars and 
harps playing, angels coming down. No, it was just another cloudy day in Texas. But I saw something inside. I could see real clear. I understood. This is between me and my Lord. This is something for this little heart right here to wake up to and to repent, turn to him and ask him for my needs. Stop going to the people. You don't need to ask from anybody. You don't need to turn to anything. There's no lucky horseshoe going to help you. There's no rabbit's foot on a keychain going to benefit you. There's no statue, no idol, no cross that's going to help you now. It's just between you and him. And you have asked. You've asked to be guided. So now watch out, because here it comes. And then I realized, too, the control, the rudder. It's up to me. It's up to me now, isn't it? I have a choice, don't I? Oh, I now know the right from the wrong, the real right from wrong. No doubt about it. Now it's up to me to do what? It's up to me daily to turn to my Lord and ask him for this guidance every single day. Let me not assume when I wake up in the morning that I'm still just as guided as I was yesterday. No. In fact, every day I need to keep asking him, guide us, guide us, guide us. And what does it say? And we already know that. We already know the first part of the Quran. The thing that Muslims recite most often, it's recited over and over and over in our prayers. We say it, Edina Saratul Mustaqim. Edina Saratul Mustaqim. Guide us. Guide us to the straight path. And there's only one guide, Allah. And he guides whomever he wills to his straight path. In a way, it should give you relief right away to go, ah, oh. because it means that you didn't have to live at the time of Abraham or Moses to be guided by their God, which is the same God. It means you didn't have to live at the time of Jesus to be guided by his God, which is the same God. And by the way, look to your Bible and see, doesn't it say that Jesus said, your God and my God, your Lord and my Lord. What's he telling you? What is he saying if he isn't telling you the same thing? And by the way, we know that because in the Quran it said that Jesus said that, that he called people to worship my God and your God, my Lord and your Lord. The only one. The only one worthy of any worship. And you can be guided by him today, right now. And this is one of the most important of all of the facets of Islam because this is the key that brings it all together, that makes it all work. I'm so happy to Allah. I thank him so much every day for this guidance. And then, remember this, although you can't guide people, you can deliver the message, then you can get up in the night and cry and ask Allah to guide them too. Guide them and guide us. And this really is the message that we want to give in our program today on Facets of Islam, that this guidance is available for anybody and everybody, regardless of their situation, their nation, their background, their parents, wherever they live, whoever they are. This guidance, this facet of Islam, is available to all. Alhamdulillah, to the one who guides. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. Rahmatullah. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host for Facets of Islam. Today I wanted to talk about something that might surprise you a little bit. When we talk about religion, you'd be surprised to hear this word, evolution. But that's not, <laughs> that's not the facet. The facet that I want to talk about is creation. But what does the role of creation versus evolution play in Islam? 
Is there room in Islam to even discuss the subject of evolution? What about other religions? Consider this. In some religions, if you even say the word evolution, they're going to go white. They're going to say, ugh. Don't even open up this subject. We don't want to hear about it. Others consider it and say, well, it's there, but we don't know how to resolve creation versus evolution. In fact, I found that only one, the only one that really has the answers is Islam. And this important facet of Islam, creation, actually explains evolution at the same time. There is, according to Islam, a God, one only God, creator, sustainer of all that exists. And his name is al khaliq This is one of his attributes. He has many attributes. We call him his names, but it's still a law. And this is one of the things that he does. al khaliq the creator. It means he is the all creator. That means that no other creator is out there. There's no other creator existing anywhere at any time. If it exists, he created it. He created everything. The heavens, the earth, and everything in between. The mountains, the rivers, the streams, the plants, the animals, the humans, the angels, the jinn. All created by one, al khaliq but where does this subject of evolution come into play? Evolutionists, those who believe that everything evolved from something else, have a few theories that they can't really back up in proof. One, they talk about that everything all started out from a single mass. Then it exploded. And then after it exploded, that all of these other things came out of that and then basically evolve to what we see today. They explain life in a way that they talk about at one time the earth was covered in water and then a blue-green algae began to surface all over the earth and then from it came some type of amoeboids that began to eat this algae and then some larger ones that ate those and bigger ones that ate those and eventually became fish-like creatures. Then these fish-like creatures developed large, what do you call, gills or fins, and they began to jump out of the water, jumping out trying to catch these gnats and bugs and butterflies and things flying over, and that that's how the first wings came about, by these things jumping out and using their fins as wings. They said it happened over millions and millions of years. Then they talk about some of the other ones who creeped up on the land trying to get food and that eventually that their fins turned into like legs and they became the prehistoric alligators, crocodiles, snakes and things of this nature. And from there, these things began living in trees and so on and then their generations evolved into others. And eventually we have these huge lizards that are going about the earth eating plants of all kinds, and then other kinds of lizards that are going to eat them. And these are the dinosaurs and Trinosaurus rex. And <laughs> the only reason I'm laughing is because of the way it's presented in the books. It's not that we as Muslims uh, would denounce or deny that such things happen, but it's the way they go about trying to put it all together. One of the things that they say is that these fish-like creatures jumped out of the water and that's how wings were first developed. They said they were jumping out of the water to catch these bugs, but they forgot those bugs had wings already. Where did they get this idea from? Where did they get this notion? You, you said these bugs or butterflies or dragonflies are flying over. Where did they get their wings? Where did they come from? And there's no answer. And when you talk about these things creeping up onto the ground, how in the world do you explain that their lungs changed from the lungs of a fish which have to breathe in the water? They don't breathe oxygen like we do. How did that get converted? And then to talk about them becoming a bird, this is ludicrous because birds are built totally different than fish. Completely. Ask anybody 
who's done even the basic study in biology and plant life and anything to do with animals, just ask them, is it really logical? And unless they've been indoctrinated with these theories too heavy, they'll have to admit, well, there's no real proof. There's no incident in particular we can point to. In fact, in fact, in recent years, a number of scientists have come to the conclusion that there are certain things that just appeared on the scene. They did not evolve from something precursor before it. No. And they said, there must be some intelligent design in the universe. And those who subscribe to that today are called those scientists talking about ID, intelligent design. Now, they're not going to say there's a God. They're not going to go that far. Most of them are going to just say, well, there's something. There's some intelligence out there, and they're calling it ID, intelligent design. How long, I'm asking myself, how long is it going to take before they wake up and realize that that intelligent design is none other than the only God that ever existed. Let us look now to the Quran and see how the Quran deals with the subject. The Quran tells us that Allah created everything and he brought into being the earth and so on all from a single mass, a one matter that he cleft it and he made it go asunder. In other words, he did bring everything out of a single mass, but he didn't say he blew it up. He divided it according to his plan. And it, you can think about this and see what makes most sense to you, what Allah says or what a scientist says. Because if it's a blowing up, if it's just something being basically thrown into chaos, how could it come about that we have the beautiful universe we see today with planets, stars, all in orbits, all going along their course as they go? This is what's described in the Quran about the universe. But according to the scientist who said everything just blew up, I'm going to ask him, just take a water glass and drop it on the driveway, on the cement, and what will happen? And it will shatter into millions of pieces, hundreds of pieces. Take another and drop it, and another, and another, and they'll keep shattering and breaking up. And never one time, out of billions of times, is it going to happen that you drop a glass and it's going to split right down the middle and make up uh, two glasses or six or twelve that are real nice and equal just like each other. Never, ever happen. And if I said something like that, they would say, that's crazy, this is ludicrous, where do you get that? Say, from you. You said the whole universe blew up like that. Think about it. Now, without going too far into that aspect, I just want to come back now to what Allah tells us in the Quran about the earth itself. He tells us in Quran that he brought all life out of water. Now, this is 1,400 years ago. 1,400 years ago, he said he brought all life out of water, meaning exactly what we know now from archaeological studies, what we know from our scientists and geologists, that in fact the earth was covered with water. Yeah. And all life came from that. In fact, the human being is made up of water. Over 90% of a human being is made out of water. We know that. But we didn't know it 1,400 years ago, did we? Let's talk about evolution. I want to talk about evolution. According to those who claim to follow evolution theory, they would pretty much adhere to what I just described to you. And then they carry it a step further. They've got some creatures evolving into others and becoming marmosets or the precursor to the monkeys. Then from these basic monkeys, they come up with these apes, such as gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees. And from them, they're telling us that these are the precursor to the human being. Well and good. Only one clear problem. And a child asked me this one. A small child said, well, if there's evolution like you said, and if everything turned into these other things, and if humans came out of monkeys, then why do we still have monkeys today? Uh, uh, good question. If you still have monkeys, apes, gorillas, 
chimpanzees, if you still have these apes, then how do you explain that? You don't need a missing link between us and monkeys. You need something even bigger than that. You need a missing link between all monkeys and humans and go back and find it. And there isn't such a thing, and they know that. In fact, there's no scientific evidence to connect the gorillas and apes with the human beings. It's a totally separate and different creation of Allah. Oh, yeah. We had Dr. Fatima Jackson on our program in Washington, D.C. for several episodes, and she explained to us, and that's her background, by the way, and she's explaining archaeology, and she explains biology as well as these other sciences. That's her job as a professor at the University of Maryland. She tells us there has never been any connection found for anything to say humans came from these other types of creation of the law. In fact, she says that these are different creations that existed at the same time. They all existed at the same time, but when there was more of one than another, they called it by the one that was dominant at the time. So if you hear about Cro-Magnum Man, for instance, and you hear about the Australopithecine, for instance, it didn't mean that's all it was there, that they progressed one into the other. It just meant that that's what they found the most of for that particular time period. Now, reflect on that. Think about what I just said, because I want to take a break, and then I want to come back into this again and tell you more about the difference between evolution and creation in the facets of Islam. Stay right there. We're going to be right back. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam. Welcome back. We've been talking about a, a subject that's pretty sensitive to some folks, the subject of evolution in religion compared to creation. Almost every religion out there claims that God is the creator or their gods create different things. But when you come to this subject of evolution, that's when the hair begins to stand out on end and people start to get really excited. Evolution, how does that fit? Well, in our earlier part of this episode, we've already discussed that a lot of what's being said by scientists is not really fact. In fact, there's no real connection between some of the things that they say and what the evidence is. One of the top anthropologists and professors of anthropology in Maryland, we've spoke about her, Dr. Fatima Jackson, explained to us in detail in several episodes that we had on our television show in Washington. And she said that actually these different time periods that they speak about, Precambian, for instance, and the Australopithecine time, the Cro-Magnum time, and so on, all of these um, different time periods didn't have just one specific creature that they claim to be the precursor to man. In fact, they all existed at the same time. But what they would find is there's more of one than another. And that when Cro-Magnum man, was, there were more of those than there were, let's say, the Australopithecine, then they called it that period. But in fact, they did exist at the same time. She says there's a time when all of them were gone. There were no more. And then human beings came on the scene separate, different, and not connected. This is exactly what we find in the Quran. Allah talks to the human beings in the Quran telling us that he created others before us and that he totally destroyed them. We know that from the Quran, that there have been others before us and that he destroyed them all. What were they like? He doesn't go into detail. What did they do? Again. We didn't find details, but the fact is that Allah has told us that he created us as human beings today in a different way, in a perfect way. And he says about it, insana fi asani taqweem, that he, in fact, is the creator of the human beings, and he created us in the best shape, the best way. The humans, as we know today, are the humans from now to the end of time. 
This also rules out, by the way, the little green men from Mars. It rules out space visitors and weird <laughs> concoctions that people have come up with from other planets. Because the only two that Allah speaks about in the Quran are the jinn and human beings. The jinn, we do not see them. They're another creation created before Adam. They're made from a smokeless fire. They've been around a long time, longer than we have. They live longer than we do. They're different than we are in many aspects. But whether they're the same is that they have free choice and they can choose to believe or disbelieve. From them are Muslims. Some are Christians, others Jewish. Some are different pagan religions or they don't believe in God at all. The important thing to know though is they have a choice just like we do. They can choose to believe they can choose to disbelieve. It's always up to them. Now, I want to come back to the subject of evolution. There is evolution mentioned in the Quran, and it's one of the names of Allah. One of Allah's characteristics described in the Quran is the evolver. He is al-bari. And al-bari means the one who takes something from one shape and then brings it into another shape, evolving it. That's one of the 99 names of Allah. So this solves it. You want to know about evolution? We know all about it. It's been in the Quran for 1,400 years. We didn't need Darwin to come along with his monkey theory. There was Islam. Islam has been there 1,400 years plus, telling us that Allah did, in fact, evolve many things. He brought this out of that and that out of this he describes it in the Quran read it but he never said that he brought the human being out of a monkey in fact we know as Muslims the same thing the scientists are today discovering that he created each thing in its perfected state he didn't create an egg and then let it hatch open that was not the normal way that he did business. The way Allah did it was to create everything by pairs. He created a rooster and a chicken. He created the lion and the lioness. He created a man and a woman. He created everything in pairs. We know that because he said that. Now the scientists have said to us, and these are the ones who are talking about ID, intelligent design. We mentioned in the first part of this episode. The scientists have found things now that have existed that just all of a sudden came on the scene and they can't explain where they came from. They didn't evolve, they just showed up. No clue? I'll give you a clue. Look in the Quran. Read the final and the last revelation to mankind for yourself and discover. Discover who is the real Khalaq, Al Khalaq, the Creator. Allah, and find out who is Al-Bari, the evolver, the one who evolves. It's Allah. Now, let's talk about the relationship between creator and created. Now here we're talking about the things that Allah created, and we're talking about Allah the creator. Some have the notion that Allah is the creation, that everything that exists is Allah, and Allah is everything that exists. Well, this is not Islam. This is called pantheism. To put God in the creation as a part and parcel of it is pantheism, not monotheism. Monotheism is to believe in one God. Now, some people today say, well, I believe in one God, and I believe that he is everything. That's still pantheism, no matter how you slice it. We know as Muslims, Allah is one. And he existed before creation. And he will destroy all of this creation. And he will still exist. And then he's going to bring it all back again in what we call the hereafter. But always Allah existed. He has no beginning and he has no end. The creation has a beginning and it has an end. As we'll all find out too soon. Each and every one of us has a beginning. I was created, you were created by Allah. We started out in our mother's wombs, in Arabic called place of mercy, by the way, Raham. 
We developed there. We grew there. We got bigger. All of this is described clearly in the Quran from the point of conception to the trimesters. Even telling us in the Quran that the first thing that baby gets is hearing and then they get their sight. The eyes are developed after the ears. This is well known today in the study. Anyone who studies the development of the fetus knows that. However, 1400 years ago, people didn't know that, yet we find it in the Quran. How could anybody know this back then? Only the one who created it in the first place. What's our relationship? What is our relationship between us as makhluk, which means the created, and al-khalik, the creator? Our relationship is this. We need to recognize he's the only creator, the only sustainer, and the only provider. And he's the only one who will forgive sins. And he's the only one who is going to give us the success in the next life. He's the one, Al-Khalid, Allah. Think again, evolution, creation, or both, only in Islam. This facet, this beautiful facet of Islam is the one that solves the mystery for the scientists. Want to know more? Read the Quran and find out about Al-Khalid, the creator, and this facet of Islam. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam, reminding you that it's only Allah that will guide. So if you want to be guided, you need to ask him for that. But he can guide you and open you up to this beautiful message and cause you to be guided as well. Till next time, Salaam Alaikum Warahmatullahi Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about one of the beautiful facets of Islam. This particular facet or aspect of Islam is called the Qadr, the Qadr. Of Allah. Now, before I get started, I want you to sit back and be ready because you're going to hear some things today. Might shock you a little bit, make you wake up. I'm going to translate the word cutter as best I can to English and tell you that it, it's something similar to destiny or predestination or kismet, as they call it. It means that everything is already planned, everything is already done deal. It's all written. There's nothing you can do except go through the motions that are planned for you. Now, right away, you're going to have some folks say, well, if that's all there is, why bother? And that's a good question. Why bother? Does Islam insist on this qadr, this predestination, as it were? What about other religions? Have you looked to other religions to see what they say about it? Is everything in the control of God? Is there anything that can happen that he has no control over? Because if you say yes, then this is not the God of Islam. Because Allah, the God of Islam, always has full and complete control over everything. Immediately, even some Muslims will say, well, wait a minute, hold on. Doesn't it say in the Quran and haven't I heard you quote from it, the verse in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 256, La deen, that there's no compulsion in the way of Islam. And if that's the case, then how could I be forced by God to do something when you just got through saying I wouldn't be forced? I don't understand. Another argument that would come up immediately from anybody would be, well, hold on. If everything is already written, then why is it that some people would get to go to paradise and other people would have to go to hell? Because if it's all in the power of Allah, if God is the one doing all of this,
Then why punish us? What did we do? Still another argument comes. Look, if everything's already written for me, then I can go out and do anything bad. I can steal, I can lie, cheat, drink, smoke, do whatever I want to do because I will say that, hey, it was written for me. I can't help it. What's the validity of their argument? Consider and think. Is there such a thing as predestination? Is there such a thing that only God has control over everything? And if so, does he have a plan? And is that plan in effect now? Even what I'm doing, sitting here, moving, doing what I'm doing, is this all part of a plan? Or do I have free will? What is the free will that's mentioned that I've been talking about in so many of our episodes? Free will. You said there's jinn and you said they have free will. You said there's malayaka or angels and they don't have free will. You said there's human beings and they have free will. So if everybody's got free will, then where does this destiny business come from? What's that all about? What are you talking about? First of all, I want you to go back, check our episodes, and you'll notice that I use the word choice. I didn't say that you had free will. If I did, what I mean by that is you have the will to choose only. No more than that. But let us, let us go through and see if Islam insists that you have to believe in this qadr or predestination of Allah. There's a beautiful hadith or story about Muhammad, peace be upon him, that one day while he was amongst his companions, he told them, ask me some question. Ask me any question about Islam. Go ahead. And they were too shy. They didn't like to ask questions. He was the prophet after all. He was the one who had been sent to them. And they were shy to ask him anything. Then Allah sent somebody and they said, a man came up out of the desert. Suddenly he just appeared and he had no traces of travel on him. His clothes were exceedingly white, meaning there was no dust or dirt on him. His hair was exceedingly black, meaning that again, no dust, no dirt, no signs of travel. He looked like somebody local and there he is right in front of them. And they said he went right up to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he squatted down and he put his knees to his knees and he put his hands on his thighs, looked him straight in the eye. And he said, what is Iman? Iman in Arabic would mean what is the faith? What is the belief system? Muhammad, peace be upon him, responded, it's to believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, and the hereafter, the resurrection, and the Qadr, the Qadr of Allah. This hadith continues and talks about some other things, but the thing that I want to emphasize here is this Qadr. At the end of the hadith, the end of the story, it says that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, asked Omar, go find this man, go bring him to me. Omar came back and said, I can't find him, he just disappeared. He said, you know who that was? That was actually the angel Gabriel. He came to teach you your religion. So it is, in fact, a very important part of Islam to believe in this Qadr of Allah, this predestination. But how do we believe in it? How do we understand it? First of all, we're human, and we can't think like God. We can't be like Allah in any way but we can take information from him. And he's giving us the guidance in the Quran and in the Hadith that come with Muhammad. Read it and understand it. Now listen, listen to this. Prophet Muhammad told us the first thing that Allah created was a pen. And then he ordered the pen to write. And the pen wrote everything that was going to happen, everything. Then the pen is laid down, the ink is dried, and in this condition, Allah now creates everything. So he never created anything until after it was all written to start with. This is what we know in Islam. Again, though, the person would say, if it's already written, then why go through it? Why do we have to go through this scenario? What's it all about? I don't get it. Again, in the creation, 
of everything that exists. Allah brings things in stages, step by step. He could have created everything all at once, boom, it's just there. But he didn't, because that's not his way. He has what's called a sunnah, or a way that he does things. Allah has a sunnah, it's called sunnah to Allah. The way that he does things in stages, step by step by step. He first created the heavens and earth, told us that. He created everything in six periods of time called ayum. We often refer to a day, the period of time of a day. But yawm, as in Yom Kippur, the Jewish celebrate Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. The Muslims also have their days, their yawm. We have Yom Kiyama, for instance, which is the day of resurrection when everybody is standing again. But those periods don't necessarily have to be a 24-hour period. They're stages. Allah brought things in stages. And likewise, he brought the human being and gave them stages of development. He tells us. He tells us about these stages. And then he says he has perfected, perfected our way so that all the human beings and all the jinn together can worship him the way he wants to be worshipped without partners, without associates. And that's the message of Islam. And how does that apply to the cutter, though? Well, all of us, Allah tells us, were inside the backbone of Adam. And he pulled us all out, and he asked us, am I not your Lord? And we all said yes. And then he took those souls, you and I and all the rest, and put them back into Adam, and he erased that from our memory. I don't remember it. You don't remember it. But we were created to forget. In the Arabic language, humans are not called humans. They're called insan, from the same root as the word to forget. Nasiya, insan, those who are created to forget, and we forgot about our meeting with our Lord. Totally and completely. We also forgot we're going to meet him again. We're going to be back in front of him again on the day of judgment. He tells us in the Quran, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. You all came from Allah. And the final event is to be returned back to him. You're going to be back in front of Allah again. Soon enough. And we know that. That's also a part of the Qadr part of the predestination. It's going to happen. There's no doubt about it. All of this is known in this aspect of Islam. Now, surely you're going to be thinking, huh, how does that work? And I want you to do that. I want you to reflect on this. This aspect of Islam, this facet that we're talking about, Qadr, is something big. And I'm going to give you all the answers to all these questions when we return. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back on facets of Islam. Stay right there. We'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum. We're back. I'm Yusuf Estes here on Facets of Islam, and we've been talking about a subject called Qadr, or predestination. If you just tuned in and you missed the first part, let me bring you up to date real fast. Qadr means predestination, or everything's already laid out, it's already planned. And we've already discovered that this is what Islam teaches, that Allah already knows what's going to happen. He has control over everything all the time. He never makes any mistakes. He doesn't forget. However, we do. <laughs> and it's all going to happen according to his plan. That's how it's going to be. Now the questions come. How is that fair? I mean, if it's written, and it's not my fault if I did something bad. It was written for me. I can't help that. Or why should some people get to go to paradise and others have to go to hell? That doesn't seem fair. If it was already written, why not let everybody just go to paradise? In fact, if it's already written, why bother? Why should we even worry about it? I can't do anything about it. God's got the control, so I'm not going to do anything. All of these are questions and insinuations that come up out of the ignorance of understanding who is Allah really and what is Islam really and who are we. Human beings cannot think like gods or God. And there's only one God, Allah, and we can't think like that. We're human. Now, we have, in fact, 
been informed, at least to the extent to know there's a God. And we also have choices that we can make every day. We have a brain, and we can choose between right and wrong. And inside of us, there's something we call it the conscious. Allah tells us that it's our ruh, our soul, our nafs, our insides, you know, ego, we'll call it, talking to us to do good or to do bad. But don't you know the difference? I mean, really. Do you know it's wrong to lie? Yeah. Do you know it's wrong to kill? Oh, yeah, yeah. Cheating is bad? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Adultery? Well, you know. No, it's bad. Okay, it's bad. Smoking, drinking, drugs. All these things are good or bad? Well, it's bad. Yeah. And you know the difference. So when you choose to do this or that, whose choice was it? Yours, yeah? But Allah already knew the choices you would make ahead of time. And then he allows you to go through this scenario called this life. But he tells you in the Quran that this life is nothing but frivolity. It is nothing. This is not the real life. He did not create it in jest. Oh, no. Huh. Allah was very serious in the way he created it. But for you and I, this temporary life that we live in here, this few years that we spend stomping around on his earth, is actually the proving ground for us. This is the place that we go through the scenario that winds up being the determining factor for us on the day of judgment. And he's the only judge. What's he going to look to, really? Is he going to look to your deeds? Or is he going to look to the intention behind the deeds? And that's the first and foremost of the teaching of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you go to the books of hadith or traditions or narrations of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you will find that the very first hadith in Sahih Bukhari, the first hadith mentioned in Imam Nawawi's Riyadh al Salahin, the first hadith mentioned in Al Arba'in, which is the 40 hadith. All of these scholars chose this hadith to be the leading one. And so many scholars since then have used this when they begin to speak or write about any subject in Islam, any facet of Islam. They start out telling you, Innama amala bin niyat. This is a saying of Muhammad 1400 years ago that he said, and Omar heard him and reported it to us, that every single action is going to be rewarded according to the intention behind it. Every amal, every action is recorded and then rewarded, punished according to the niyyah. Niyyah means your intention. What was it you wanted when you did it? What did you expect to happen? So if you accidentally did something, this wouldn't count against you in Islam. But if you intended to do something, of course it would count against you. But come back to the qadr. How could I do a bad deed or a good deed and have it accounted or attributed to me if it's already planned, if it's already a part of Allah's destiny? Watch this. The mistake comes from the human being who's sitting there thinking that he has free will. We talk about it, but we don't realize what we're saying. Do you have free will? Do you have free will? And if your answer is yes, I have a question for you. Can you make it rain? And if it's raining, can you make it stop? And if it's dark, can you make the sun come out? I'll go one better. So easy for you. You as a human being right now, can you make one hair grow out of your face? Go ahead. Go ahead. And if you can't, then where is your free will? You don't really have will. You have choices. You're making choices. It's being offered to you X or Y, and you're choosing. A or B, and you're choosing. One or two, and you're choosing. You're constantly making choices but you never really have control over the situation. You say, for instance, tomorrow 
I will go to work and I will take the train. But you don't really know that because you can't control. You can't control the train that's going to be there on time or the train will even run at all. Maybe it will rain real, real hard and they'll shut the trains down. That happens. Maybe you won't have a job tomorrow. Somebody calls you from the office and said you got fired or the company's out of business. Whoa. Or maybe you won't even wake up. Maybe you'll oversleep. You'll sleep all day. Or maybe you won't wake up at all. Maybe you'll die in your sleep tonight. So where's your will? If you have willpower, why don't you just will that you keep on living and you don't die? And you can't do that either, huh? Hmm. It's only Allah who has will. And his will is what's going to happen. And it's already known to him. But the key here, now pay attention because this is the key. This is the answer. You and I don't know what his will is. We don't know. Oh, we have some clues, by the way, of some things. Some general picture. As Muslims, we know that for sure those who are believing in him trying their best, have a good chance to go to paradise. That we know. We know there is a paradise. We know there's a hell. We know there's a day of judgment. But who's going to go? I don't know. And you don't know. Who will go to paradise? And who will go to hell? I don't know. And you don't know. What we know is the kind of person who goes to paradise is a good person who believes, does good works, and repents for their sins. The kind of person that goes to hell is the disbeliever who rejects the proof when it comes to them. He rejects the fact that there really is God and he refuses to do good deeds. He doesn't even take care of the poorest poor that just need a morsel of food. Yes, these people would be destined to hell. But who are they? I don't know. And you don't know. Because as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, a person can go through the whole life acting so bad, so evil, that he's almost within an arm's length of being in hell, but then what is written for him, his cutter, his destiny, which is written for him, overtakes him, and as a result, he acts like somebody from paradise. When he dies, he goes to the paradise. Then another person he described would be so good in this life and so kind and so generous and so sweet and so loving, and you'd think, oh my God, this guy is what? He's got to go to paradise. In fact, he becomes so close to paradise, he could almost reach into it. But then what's written for him overtakes him. And he acts like somebody from the hell. And as a result, when he dies, he goes to hell. Now, some people might ask you about that. Now, wait a minute. This guy was acting good, and then God forced him to go to hell. Why? Or this guy was acting so bad, but then God forced him to go to paradise. I don't get it. I still don't see it. Oh, bad. And think what I told you to start with. You don't know, I don't know, but you and I have choices. I'm making choices right now to be sitting here talking to you. And you're making choices to sit there and listen. It's a choice. You don't have to listen. I don't have to stay here, but I want to. And you want to know what I'm going to say next, so you stay. It's a choice. And Allah knows when he creates something, already everything about it, its whole nature. And he knows that there are those who will do some good in this life, but they're really evil. And he knows there are those who will do some evil in this life, but they're really good. So what does he do? And we know from the teaching of Islam that Allah punishes some people in this life so they won't have to suffer in the next life. But he also gives some people good in this life because they're not going to get any good in the next life. Simply because of their nature. He knows what he made and it's up to him. He created you, but you always have that choice. Choose now. Choose right now. I did. You'll be glad you did. Choose the right path. Choose to submit to God on his terms in peace. And that word in Arabic Submission to God in peace is Islam. You can do it. All you have to do is say, God, guide me. Make it your choice. 
let him have his will here on earth as it is in heaven. That's told to us before by the prophets. It's told to us by Muhammad. God's will on earth as it is in heaven. That's the Qadr of Allah. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host on Facets of Islam. And today I would like to talk about one of the most important facets of all Islam, and that's the subject of God. Who is God? Where is God? How do we know that there is a God? Is there proof? I've often reflected from the Bible and more recently from the Quran about the teachings offered about the God, the God of the universe. In the Arabic language, he's called Allah. In the Hebrew language, we find a similar root something referred to even now as Elah or El and Aramaic Allah and even in the Old Testament we find reference to Yahweh. We find reference in the New Testament to Eloi and Eli. All of these can be related, related to the characteristics of the one true God. In Arabic, the word Allah comes from Elah. Elah means something worship. Anything you worship is an Elah. A rock, a stick, a stone, or a bone can be an Elah to somebody. A star, the moon, the sun, whatever is worshipped is the Elah. The plural is Aleha the gods. But when we use the word Allah, this is unique and it's special because everything in Arabic language has gender, such as the sun, the moon, trees, rocks, stones. Anytime you mention something, you're going to find it has gender with it. Even a fly has gender, she, an ant, she, the sun, the moon, all of the different things are going to have male or female gender attached to it. We don't say it when we refer to Allah. And that's the only reason why Muslims use the word he when they speak of about Allah. We don't say it. There isn't really a way to say it referring to Allah in Arabic. But the word Allah also has no gender. It's not male and it's not female. Another interesting thing about this word is it can't be made plural. I already showed you the plural of God, Aleha, gods. But Allah cannot have Allahs, for instance. It just doesn't work. The only one. So the word itself means the only one to be worshipped. Not male, not female, never plural. This is the meaning of the word. Before I go any further, I already know there are going to be those who are going to say, hold on a second, I bought a Quran at the store the other day, or somebody gave me the Quran, and in the Quran, it clearly says, he, 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 over and over, he. It says right here, huwa, huwa means he. It says it. Well, as I just explained, we don't say it about Allah. So we say he, out of respect, dignity, honor for the only God to worship. Okay, but wait a minute. Another question. Hold on. It says, we created the heavens and earth. Khalaqna, which means we created. It says we. Ah. Hmm, how do you deal with that? Well, actually it says in the Quran many times. We, our, us. So how do we uh, resolve that? How are we going to 
come up with an answer for this. Clearly plural. Yes? No. As a matter of fact, this is called the royal we. Whenever a king or a queen decree a decree, they say we. This is well known. It's been established for centuries and centuries that the one who is the dictator or the main one in charge over everything, he uses this kind of statement, we. We declare the following, we. But he means me, myself, and I, just me. In the same way, Allah uses this royal we. It's found in English, it's found in Arabic, and it's also found in Hebrew. So that we don't misunderstand, I want you to know the word itself, Allah, is the perfect name to use for the Almighty. Now, some people might say, and I've heard it said, that Allah has nothing to do with the God of the Bible. That's incorrect. It's very incorrect. And the person saying this obviously has no knowledge of it. Because, in fact, you can verify what I just told you real easy by going to the Bible in any hotel or motel. The Bibles that are placed there are put there by a group called the Gideon Society. And the beginning of each one of their Bibles has a description of the languages that they have also translated the Bible to. The first language they give you the example of is called Afrikaans language. The second one is Arabic. And in the Arabic language, it gives you a sample of the Bible. John chapter 3, verse 16. And it says, real clear, the verse that everybody knows it, for God so loved the world. It's how it starts out. For God so loved the world. The word in Arabic is Allah. So if you know that the Arabs today that are Christians, and there are many Christian Arabs, if you know they say Allah, and Arabic is an ancient language, then you have to agree, hmm, there's some validity to what I'm saying. Also, if you go to the Jewish book in Arabic, and that would be for any Arabs who happen to be Jews, you can open it up, page one, and the word Allah in Genesis is there 17 times on the first page. Allah, 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 Allah. Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha. It's right there. You can read it. So if Arab Jews and if Arab Christians are using this word, Allah, and you understand the meaning of it, then why would you continue to use the word God? Because... The word God didn't exist at the time of any of the prophets. You see, the English language is where we get this word God from. And the English language didn't exist even a thousand years ago. It wasn't until the Normans invaded the Saxons and at that time implemented this language called Anglish for the Anglicans. And that's where it came from, this word, God. So nowhere in all the history of all the monotheistic religion will you find this word, God. But you will find this word, El, Elah, Allah, and Allah. And this was used by the prophets. Now that I've established the source of the word, let's talk about what it actually means and how we understand it. The concept of Allah in Islam is that God is one. He's unique. He has no partners. He existed before all other of the creation. He is the only creator. All that's created is created by him. And he's the only provider, the only sustainer of everything. Nothing exists except that he created. And nothing continues except that he allows it to continue. He has full and complete power, total control at all times of everything. In other facets of Islam programs that we've had, episodes, we've talked about this. We've even mentioned 
from the Quran, his description of himself being the ever-living, self-subsisting, that he never needs to rest or sleep. All that's in the heavens and earth belongs to him. And that there's none that's going to come between him and his creation except that he has to give him permission. That he has full knowledge of everything that exists everywhere in the universe. And that you have no knowledge at all except the knowledge that he gives you. It even continues by saying he never gets weary from taking care of all of his creation. He's mighty, majestic, and powerful over all things. This is more or less a partial translation from ayah number 255 in chapter 2 of the Quran, Surah Baqarah, the cow. Many statements of Allah in the Quran indicate immediately that this is from the one and only creator of the universe. He tells us from the very beginning, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah, the all merciful, the all gracious, most merciful, most gracious, most benevolent. So many words we try to come up for that. We've spoken about his names in other episodes. But who is this Allah? And he's telling us he created everything. Now here's a question. Here's a good question for you. If Allah is the only creator and there isn't anything else that he didn't create, is Allah good? The answer is yes. It says so in the Quran. Is Allah ever bad? Out of Allah, of course not. Never. So then who created evil? Because if there's evil in the world and you said that God is the only creator, where did evil come from? Ah. There's a good question, and I'm going to let you think about it. Think about that one while we take a break. We're going to come back and give you the answer to that and some other questions about Allah in the next part of our episode, Facets of Islam. Stay right there. We'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum. We're back. This is Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam. We've been talking about Allah, the God, the one and only. We've explained already the meaning of the word Allah and a little bit about the aspects or the facets here of his characteristics, his, his attributes. Then we came to a question when we went to break, and the question was, is God good? Yes, God is good. God is pure. Okay, great. Is there evil in the world? Yes, there is. Where did it come from? Did God put evil in the world? If so, is God evil? Oh, oh good question. <laughs> the answer is in the Quran. The answer is real clear. If you go through the 114 chapters of the Quran, you constantly see how Allah is telling you that he's the only God to worship, that he's all merciful. He is all loving. He's al Wadud, the loving God. He's pure, and he's good. But he also tells you where evil comes from. He tells you clearly. But I'll take you to one reference at the end, and then we'll go back to the beginning. The end of the Quran, chapter 113, next to the last, it goes something like this. A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir rahim Kul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq min shari ma khalaq. I'm going to stop right there because he gave you the answer. He's telling you to say, I seek refuge with the Lord of daybreak from the evil of that he created. The Lord of daybreak, of course, is Allah. He's the Lord of everything. But you say, I seek refuge with the Lord of daybreak from the evil of he created. Evil? was created by Allah. Whoa, hold on. Now let's go back to the second chapter of the Quran, go all the way back to number two, and look at verse 102. In the translation, it's going to tell you about two angels that God sent down to the people of Babylon. And he ordered the angels to warn the people about something they had called Seher magic so the angels told them we're coming with something here called magic seher but don't use it 
This is a test. Don't use it. It's bad. And it's the kind of magic that can make a husband and wife separate and divorce. It's the kind of magic that can make things happen in people's lives. It's something here you've got to be careful of. Don't use it. And they taught him magic. The two angels are called Harut and Marut. And they're mentioned right there. Go look it up. Read it for yourself. Chapter 2, verse 102. Now, right away, you're going to say, well, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. <laughs> in all the other episodes of Facets of Islam, you guys have been telling us over and over and over, there's only one God. He has all the power. There is no, none to worship but him. Magic's not real. Uh, superstition isn't for real. But now, all of a sudden, here you've got <laughs> in your book, and you're, ah, what are you saying? We're saying that Allah sent down this as a test. It's not really, really magic. What it is, is something that Allah allows to happen. Because everything always happens by His permission. In one of our other episodes when we spoke about Qadr, we understood that there isn't anything that happens except by His permission. Totally and completely from Him. The life that we live in is a test. And he's put good things in this life and bad things in this life. And he's given us the choice without the evil, without these superstitions, magic, and so on, then the choice wouldn't be the same, would it? Now let's come to the subject of prophets. Prophets have miracles. Oh, look, here's a prophet who threw a stick down. It became a snake. A prophet who hit the water. It split and the people walked through the water. A prophet that had... A rock that split open and a camel came out of it. Another prophet who brought the dead back to life. And another prophet who was able to cure the sick and the lame and make them be able to walk again. Somebody's blind and now they can see. Oh, oh, doesn't that mean these prophets, maybe they have some kind of powers with Allah? Huh? But in fact, that's not true. Every case that we find about these prophets mentioned in Quran says that they only did it by the permission of Allah. He let it happen. We call it wajza or a miracle. But really, it's from Allah. His permission. Anything that happens, happens by his permission. Have you ever heard Muslims talk? They say, mashallah, mashallah. Do you know what it means? It means because Allah willed for this to happen. Oh, somebody got a good job. MashaAllah, because Allah willed. Oh, somebody had a new baby today. Oh, MashaAllah, because Allah willed. Anytime you see anything, you say MashaAllah. Somebody got sick. We say, MashaAllah, it's from Allah. But may Allah give them shifa or the cure. Because the cure also is only with Allah. We understand as Muslims, nothing happens except by the permission of Allah. One of the things we know in Islam that sometimes people could be praying and asking for something and there was something horrible coming right toward them, right toward them. But then Allah diverted it and it went away and they never had it happen. They didn't even know what it was. They didn't know it, it took place. So it's always important for us to keep asking Allah, turning to Allah, seeking refuge in Allah from the evil that he created and from the evil inside ourselves. Because every one of us has within us the capability to do evil. Oh yes, we all have that. It's so easy, isn't it? Oh, you don't know how mad I can get. You don't know how bad I can be. Have you heard people say things like that? You just don't know how bad I can be. That's not too smart, is it? I don't hear people say too often, you don't know how good I can be. Oh, I can be better than this. Well, do it. <laughs> let's do that. Let's focus, really, you and I, let's focus on seeing how good we can be instead of how evil. Whoever does anything good for the sake of God, for Allah, he knows that, and it's recorded, and it's with him. Don't worry about that. But whoever does any evil, and he doesn't repent from that, he's going to have to answer for that on the Day of Judgment. Because in the final analysis, everything is going to be judged only by Allah. He tells us in the Quran about those people who come to the right belief and they do the good deeds. And he tells us that the reward is with them, the ajr, 
will be with them and they'll find it on the day of judgment. It's going to be there waiting for them. And he says that he's the one going to be there for that judgment. And he asks us, isn't Allah the best of all the judges? Ah. And he tells us in the Quran, Inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raji'un. That from Allah you came, and to Allah is the return. And that doesn't mean that you came out of Allah, and you're going into Allah. It means you were in front of Allah in the beginning, and you're going to be back in front of him again at the end. He asked all of us when we were in the backbone of Adam. He asked us, am I not your Lord? And we all said yes. Then he made us to forget that. We don't have any memory of it. In Arabic, we're called insan, which means from the same root as the word nasiya. Ana nasiya, I forgot. The one that's created to forget, the human, insan, has forgotten that he's been in front of his Lord and he forgets that he's going to be in front of his Lord again. And throughout the Quran, Allah tells us over and over, Adhkar Allah, Adhkar, dhikr of Allah. Remember Allah. La tansa, dhikr Allah. Don't forget to remember Allah. Remind each other about Allah. Tawasso, encourage and exhort each other. To remember the haq of Allah. Remember. Think. Realize. Allah is reminding you and telling you to remind each other. Think about Allah. Be afraid of Allah. How are you stealing when you know Allah is watching you? How are you cheating and you know he's listening to every word you're saying? How is it that you could go out here and commit these sins? Adultery. Drinking. Smoking. Cheating. Lying. Killing. How can you do all of these things knowing you're in the presence of Almighty God? How? And Allah is as close to you as your juggler vein. But he's never in his creation. He comes in the last part of the night to take the prayers of the believers. But still, he's not like his creation. We don't compare him to the creation. He's not like anything. He says, وَلَمْ يَقُولْ لَهُ كُفُوَانْ Ahad. And there is nothing like unto him anywhere, any time, any place. And he is unique. Ahad. 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 And this is the word which means uniquely one in Arabic. And if you believe that Allah is uniquely one and that he's the only God and you believe that you need to turn to him, then do it now. Do it before it's too late. Nobody knows how long you're going to live. And only Allah lives forever. This is one of the most important facets of Islam. Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Islam, like a precious gem, has many beautiful facets. Explore with us now the facets of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host on Facets of Islam. And in this episode, I particularly wanted to talk about one of my favorite subjects, the subject of da'wah, da'wah to Islam. Dawah, what does it mean exactly? Well, whenever you have a gathering of people, maybe a feast, a wedding, celebration of some kind, you'd like for folks to attend and be there with you, so you send out something to them to get them to come. What is it you send out? Whenever you ask people to come, what are you doing? You're inviting. You're sending out invitations, is it? Yeah. And this is Dawah. The way that this is understood in Islam is to invite to the way of your Lord and to argue in a way that is better. What does that mean, argue? Well, some people think it means to do a debate. And in fact, 
there is a lot of discussion, pro and con, while we're talking about the different facets of Islam, without a doubt. Yet when we talk about debates these days, often we find that on both sides we have folks who are not really as interested in finding the truth as they are as promoting their own particular scheme. So when we look to the meaning of the Quran, we find that that's not what's being asked from us. What's being asked here is to invite in a way that is better, in a good way, a polite way, a kind way. The Quran, of course, for Muslims, is the source of everything that we do. When we look into the Quran, we find many verses telling us to invite, invite people to come to the correct and proper understanding of their Lord and what it is that he wants from us. The first thing to invite to would be the correct belief that there is only one God. He's one, unique, without partners. He creates, although he's not created. He is the only thing that's eternal. Some of these things we've talked about in other facets of our program. But when we talk about this, this is so key, it's so important that we cannot help but say it again and again. Almost every episode you'll notice we're talking about this subject of who is the God, the one and only creator, sustainer of all that exists. Additionally, throughout the Quran, we find something called adhkar, or a dhikr of Allah, to remind. Allah also asks us in the Quran to reflect, reflect on his creation and reflect on things that he's telling us. And all of this could be considered dawah, to invite. This particularly works good with those who have been endowed with a proper mental stability and reasoning because you can't reason with an unreasonable person but if somebody really wants to know the truth and they're willing to put aside misconceptions and do away with prejudices that they might have then quite possibly they're going to be a good candidate to learn about and accept some of the teachings of Islam after coming to this correct belief, the next and most important thing is to explain to someone what the relationship is between the God, Allah, and the person, us. How should that relationship be? Well, the creator, the owner, has obviously the most rights. In fact, he has all rights, doesn't he? He's the master. We're not. In fact, we've been created and we're within his grasp, within his power. Therefore, we can only consider ourselves as slaves or servants to his will, to his command, what it is that he wants from us. We should do this, this relationship that we have. We should do our part in humbleness, in gratitude. Actually, we should surrender, surrender or give over our free choice. He's given us free choice. We should surrender that free choice in favor of what he has commanded. We should do his will, his will on earth as it is in heaven. And of course, if you know the Bible, that's where I quoted it from. Because it's the same God and it's the same message. Do what God wants you to do. How should I do it? I have to surrender. Surrender over my will, my free choice. I have to submit to his terms. He's got conditions. He's got statements, clear commands saying, do this, do that, do so and so. These commandments have been there since time immemorial, what to do and what not to do. Going all the way back to Adam, the first man, don't eat the fruit. Continuing all the way to Moses, don't have any other gods beside God. Continuing all the way to Muhammad, La ilaha illallah. No God to worship except Allah. Same message. So I have to submit. He orders us, don't take an innocent life. He orders us, don't kill the little children, considering that they're going to be in competition with you for your provisions. He tells us, 
say the truth. Say the truth, even if it's against yourself and your family. Bear truth. Don't bear false witness. Hmm. Also tells us about adultery. Mm -mm. Adultery is really something horrible, and you've been ordered not to do it. Alcohol. Mm -mm. Eating the meat of the pig. No, can't do that. Pray. Pray. Pray unceasingly in your heart. Establish salah. Establish the proper worship in the direction that you've been ordered. Pay charity. Give zakah. Purify your income by giving to the poor and the needy and the indigent and help others. And don't fill your stomach and go to sleep at night while others around you go to sleep hungry. These are commandments. Commandments that we find throughout Islam, we know that these commands have to be obeyed. We have to obey. We have to do it in sincerity, not just to show off, oh, some people are watching me, watch me be nice. I'm going to be nice. <laughs> are they still watching? No? Okay, I don't need to. I can't do that. And I have to do it in peace. Whatever comes. I expected a nice day today, but it rained. I didn't know it was going to rain. But still, I'll be at peace with that. I'll accept that. I'll smile. Because this is from my Lord. He knew it would rain. I didn't. So it's raining. Alhamdulillah. Praise be to God. All of this describes the attitude of gratitude so necessary for a Muslim. Let's review real fast. We said surrender, submit, obey, sincere, and peace. And guess what? In Arabic language, you can say all of that with one word. Islam. Stislam. Aslama. Salam. Islam, and we see for sure that this is the proper way to be with our Lord, to be in this, this concept, to be in this mentality, doing what he wants. That's what we're calling to when we call to the belief in one God and doing what he wants us to do. How hard is that? Is this something that he's asked us to do? Do we find this in the Quran? Listen to the statement. A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim. Kuntan khayrun umatin ukhrijat linnas ta'at maruna bil maruf wa tan hawna anhil munkar wa tu'minun billah. You're the best of nations raised up because you call to all of the maruf, all of that Islam stands for, the belief in one God and obeying him and being a good person and being someone in civilization who is contributing to the society in a positive manner. That's the maruf. Calling to this and forbidding the munkar. Forbidding people from what? From false worship, false notions, lies, cheating, stealing, killing, adultery, alcohol, all the things that we know take people away from the beautiful and wonderful belief, the wonderful life of being a Muslim. Call to that. Give the da'wah to that. Okay. Now we think about this. Hmm. Imagine for a minute. Somebody sends you an invitation. You get an invitation mail, you open it up. Oh, Yusuf Estes has invited us to come over. Where does he live? Oh, it says 123 Main Street. Come on over. They're going to have a big get-together, a big festival, a feast. Ah, great. When is it? Tomorrow, 4 o'clock. Tomorrow, 4 o'clock. Okay, here we are. We're looking for 123 Main Street. Where is it? Where's 123? There's 122, 124. Where's 123? Oh, there's no house. It's just an empty place. Dirt. There's nothing there but dirt. Oh, who is that? Is that Yusuf? Yusuf? You're sitting under a tree. Uh, is this 123 Main Street? Yeah, come on in. I'm into what? This is dirt. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Oh, just sit down. Oh, okay. Wow. We sit there, we're talking, talking. And finally, uh, excuse me, Yusuf, 
don't like to bother you, but didn't you invite us to come to a feast of some kind? Oh, yeah. Have you got any food? Uh, no. No food. So you invited me to your place and you don't have a place. You invited me to food and you don't have any food. What are you inviting me to? The parallel that I'm giving you right now is what? Very clear. Inviting me to what? If you don't have Islam, if you don't live Islam, if you're not following the teachings of the Quran and the way of Muhammad, then how in the world can you call others, invite others to this? I'm going to let you think about that. I want to come back now after the break and tell you some of the ways of calling or inviting to Islam. So we can take this break right now. We're going to be right back. Don't go away. You're watching Facets of Islam. Salam alaikum. I'm Yusuf Estes, your host here on Facets of Islam. We're back and we're talking about the subject of invitation to Islam or what's called in Arabic, da'wah. This word da'wah is pretty powerful. It means to invite, but it also means to call, call on someone, like you call someone to come and eat. But you can also say this word du'a from the same root, meaning to call on Allah to ask him for something. I want you to remember that because we're going to be talking about that in just a second. What I was talking about in the first part of the episode, if you missed it, if you just tuned in, maybe you missed that. I was saying that how can you call to something you don't have? How do you call to Islam, but you don't live Islam? Do you call somebody to it, but you don't do it? And imagine, here's somebody at work. Let's say he's a Muslim, he's been working on the job a long time, and then all of a sudden one day he decides, you know what, I'm going to call all my friends to Islam. Everybody I work with, all my associates, I'm going to tell them about La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, the message of Islam, etc. I've got some pamphlets, I've got some books, I'm going to give them to these people, and then I'm going to ask them, what do you think you'd like to be a Muslim? Well, sure enough, somebody comes up to me and says, um, so you're a Muslim. Yeah, I'm a Muslim. Yeah. Well, the booklet that you gave out said Muslims pray five times a day. Oh, yeah, five times a day. Muslims have to do that. I see. Okay. But we've known you working here on the job with us seven years. And in all those years, we never saw you pray. What about that? Oh, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, I'm a Muslim, uh, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't pray. I mean, you know, uh, 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 okay, okay, that's all right. And this really is the image that a lot of people have of Muslims because they have seen what Muslims do and don't do, and then they think that's Islam, but it isn't. In fact, what well, we know for sure this is against Islam. If somebody doesn't pray, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Laysa minha. He's not from us who leaves the Salah. And there's a curse, according to the Prophet himself. He said there's a curse on the one who doesn't fast the month of Ramadan. And how could any Muslim consider himself really being in Islam and he won't take the time to estimate his own wealth to feed the poor and the hungry and the orphans. And how is it that you wouldn't even make the attempt to do the Hajj when it's available to you? How? As far as being honest, as far as dealing fair with people and being just and not cheating, all of these things, Islam insists for Muslims to do that. So before, my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, that you go out and start telling them, I'm going to call to Islam. How about considering a little Islam for yourself and your family? I want to ask you about something. Have you ever watched, especially on a rainy day, there's these little puddles of water here and there, and a boy comes along and he finds some rocks. What will the boy do? He loves to pick up, I know I, <laughs> the same way when I was a kid, pick up a rock, you love to throw it in the water, don't you? But when you throw that rock in the water, have you ever noticed something? The biggest splash comes right next to the rock. And then a smaller splash after that and another and another. And it's called ripples. The ripples go out. Some people even call it something the ripple effect. When something goes out, goes out, goes out. But it's never as strong when it gets out to the edge of the puddle as it was where the rock made the impact in the water. 
true? In the same way, the da'wah to Islam makes the impact on the person. First, make the impact on yourself. Call yourself to the right way. Begin immediately doing what Islam calls for. Live Islam. And I know in my own personal case, brothers and sisters in Islam, listen to me. I met a man who was a Muslim, and I did business with him. In fact, I was trying to convert him to my religion. Throughout the whole time, I watched this man stop for his prayers. He did his fasting. He paid his charity, even more than was required from him. This man lived Islam. I had all the right answers, this and that, and Christian, and Bible, and Jesus, and Trinity, and blah, blah, blah. But when it was all said and done, I looked to this man's actions, and I said, you know, really, this is what I want to be. I want to be like this. I began to implement some of these good teachings in my own life right away as a Christian now, living this good life, and realize this is what Jesus was on. This is what John the Baptist was upon. And this is what all of the prophets came and This is what they all taught. Sacrifice of things of this life to get a better place in the next life. That's what I understood from his actions and from his way. Not just from his speech. But then he told me something about rights. And how Allah has the most rights. And how people have rights on you. Even your body has rights. And I began to learn more and more the teachings of Islam. Not just from the mouth of somebody but from their actions. Brothers and sisters, this hits me hard because I realize there's so many people out there if they could just see an example, see a demonstration of the way, the way of Islam, living like our prophet, peace be upon him, the one who we give so much eulogy to. You got people out here celebrating his birthday, but on the other hand, they don't even want to take time to be honest and sweet and humble like he was this is false and it won't carry any weight on the day of judgment to live Islam and to follow the example of the Prophet Muhammad this this is the true way to celebrate his life this is what we need to think about because only then will people really observe and say you know what I like to be like this guy I would like to be like this woman over here and you know, look, she covers herself up. She has modesty. She's not trying to show her body off, calling people to that. Rather, we appreciate her for who she is, for her mind, not for some appendage of her body that we can stare at. And doesn't that make better sense? The life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was completely that, calling to the truth. Even before he was the prophet, he was known as what? The truthful the trustworthy, the one who consoles the relations of family. He was known for his integrity. He was honored and respected for his good character even before he was the prophet of Islam. And so now when we see in his character this, why aren't we following that? And when we call to something we don't have, this is hypocrisy. This is nifaq. And no wonder the people don't listen. No wonder they reject, because they're rejecting the way we behave. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave a beautiful, beautiful speech, one of the last of all the speeches he ever gave, called the khutbah wada, means the farewell speech. In it, he called for the equal treatment of all people, that no Arab is over a non-Arab, and no non-Arab is over an Arab, no white man is over a black man, and no black is over a white. But all of us are equal in the sight of Almighty God, that he, in fact, is the only judge in the final analysis. And he's looking to the heart because he knows what he created. And at the end of that beautiful speech, when he talked about women's rights, people's rights, he came down to something real important at the end. He said, did I deliver the message? And they all said yes. And he said... I swear, did I deliver the message? And yes, and by Allah, bear witness, I delivered this message. The message of la ilaha illallah. None to worship except Allah. He said, and it's hope that those that are present here today 
will take this message to those who are not here. And it's hoped that those who hear it at the end will understand it better than those who are here today. And today, in the real world, in the real life, there are people who are living and practicing real Islam. Oh, there's a lot of phony balonies out there as well. I'll grant you that. There's a lot of stacks and groups out here who claim to be doing Islam and we know what they're doing. But still there are good people who are trying their best to live the life, the life of a real Muslim, submitting to God, doing his will. And as a result, as a result of this, Allah guides. But remember this, never forget this. You don't guide. You call, you give the message, but you don't guide. It's only Allah that guides. And whoever he guides, they'll never be misguided. The message you're calling to is not your own. The message you're calling to is the worship of the one and the only God, the Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the two worlds. Share this message. Do the Dawah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi